Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Partial funding is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on another episode of Market Journal. I'm Bryce Duskett. Hope springs eternal. As we continue through the month of March, we know that warmer days are ahead as we look toward and gear up for another planting season. Now, coming up on today's program, we'll do a deep dive into the grain markets. Jeff Peterson of Heartland Farm Partners is going to join us coming up here in a little bit. We'll also discuss planter maintenance and cattle nutrition. That is what we have coming up, but first, as we start today's show, we wanted to remind you that the deadline to enroll in the Agriculture Risk Coverage or Price Loss Coverage Safety Net programs is quickly approaching. The deadline for the 2023 crop will be on March 15th. So if you've not done so yet, now is the time to get in touch with your local Farm Service Agency office. Happening last week, around 15 Nebraska soybean farmers and industry stakeholders traveled out to the Pacific Northwest as part of the Nebraska Soybean Board See for Yourself program. That program is aiming to show farmers where soybeans go once they leave Nebraska. The trip also introduced them to other types of agriculture, like commercial fishing, which is a vital part of Washington's economy. Alex McAviga traveled with that group, and she has this story. The seafood industry in Washington is very robust, but not a lot of people, I think, know about the industry. Tell me more about the seafood industry here. I'm uh, sure. So Washington, of course, is a um, certainly a regional seafood distributor, but also a global seafood distributor in terms of what is harvested here on our coastal waters. So we are in Westport today. Westport is the largest seafood landing port in Washington state, and it's among the top 10 seafood landing ports in all of the United States by volume. So uh, we average 100 to 120 million pounds of seafood harvested here in our uh, small community each year. So you've had the chance to mingle with some of these Nebraska soybean producers who came all the way out here over 1700 miles. We've learned a lot about the commonalities between mm -hmm. the two industries. Share a little bit more about that aspect. Certainly. Well, what is that saying that um, farmers and fishermen are America's royal family? You only get in by birth or marriage, and that's certainly the case. So fishing is definitely a natural resource-based industry. It's very generational. It's um, certainly cultural. A lot of the people here in Westport where we are today are um, third, fourth, fifth generation fishermen, um, and it's a part of their heritage. Yeah, yeah. Tell me more about some of the misconceptions that you guys deal with. Absolutely. Um, like so many, there's a misconception that um, the industry is in crisis, it's over harvested, that seafood is a um, dying industry, which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, our fisheries in, in Washington are robust and healthy, um, and the, the fisheries in the United States are some of the most well-managed, sustainable fisheries in the world. So if you're um, interested in supporting that, buy local seafood, buy domestic product. What do you hope these group of producers take back home to Nebraska with them? Well, firstly, I hope they go back home and buy domestic seafood, um, certainly Washington seafood, um, knowing now where it's come from, who harvests it, and how um, sustainably it's harvest, harvested is important. And I hope they understand that even though we're on the water, um, these natural resource-based um, industries are very much alike. We have very much in common. I think we have uh, similar achievements, similar struggles. Uh, so it's fun to know that we're all in this together, really. All of that information again coming here from the 2023 Nebraska Soybean Board See for Yourself Tour, a chance where Nebraska's own soybean producers are coming here to the Pacific Northwest to learn more about where their soybeans ultimately go. Again, that Molly Bold joining us with the Port of Grace Harbor. I'm Alex McAvicker reporting. The group of Nebraska soybean farmers also toured the Port of Grays Harbor AGP Terminal, a local cranberry farm, and an aquaculture facility. Of course, that trip was sponsored by the Nebraska Soybean Board. 
As we shared with you last week, the Nebraska Women in Ag event recently took place out in Kearney. The two-day event had something for everyone, including for cattle producers. One workshop, which was titled Beef Nutrition Made Simple, gave attendees a better grasp on the basics of beef nutrition and ration formulation in a simple and interactive manner. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has this story. Make it simple. This is the stuff. That At this year's Women in Ag Conference, Extension educator Alfredo Di Costanzo made the point that he believes beef prices will be very good for producers this year. That means a good nutrition plan could benefit a producer's bottom line as well as their cattle's development. Beef nutrition can seem complicated at times. However, the message he had for his audience is it wasn't as complicated as we often make it out to be. We make it complicated. It's not that complicated. So we used uh, visuals and logic to make it simple and narrowing the range of concern for which the person should worry about for the amount of energy that should be in a feed. This year, beef prices are going to be very good. We've been hearing about it for a long time. There's actually, the trends are showing on the futures uh, for feeder and fed cattle. So we expect feeder calves to sell at a premium relative to 2022 and of course 2021. So my message to producers this year is we have to be sure that nutrition programs, particularly mineral and vitamin, are well uh, laid out so that these cattle can survive any challenges with immune function and also grow well so that we can sell the most pounds by having the most cattle to sell at the highest possible weight in the fall. There are many tools in the arsenal of a cattle producer when it comes to making nutritional decisions for their herd. One tool that shouldn't be overlooked or underestimated is the implementation of body condition scoring. Body condition score is a tool to use in mature cows, in the regular cow herd, attempting to determine from a visual appraisal of fat cover what their energy status is at that point. With the expectation, of course, that in, during lactation, these cows will milk themselves out, giving that milk to their babies, so that in the early parts of lactation, it's a time of concern to be sure that we have those cows in sufficient condition score so they're ready to rebreed. They have about 80 days to rebreed. We want them at a condition score of, of five. If they're a mature cow, condition score of six. If they're a young cow just coming onto the herd and then come around to weaning time. That is the time when their energy requirements are lowest. Uh, hopefully it was a good year, so they have enough condition. Condition again of five on the cows, six on the young animals. And then over the course of the winter, we just strive to keep that condition at that level. Beef nutrition is not a one size fits all concept. When it comes to determining different needs for different cattle, Age will be a major factor in dictating varying nutritional needs. Age is a big uh, determinant for needs, and the main reason is they cannot eat enough to meet their needs with a lower quality feed. So if we're trying to feed a young calf after weaning with a high proportion of forage, hay for example, you can do it, but they will not gain hardly any weight because they just cannot eat enough to satisfy their growing needs. So age is a big one, and then what we're doing, what their function is, right? So a cow that is pregnant eventually needs to have sufficient amount of energy and protein to raise that baby to term healthy and ready to thrive in this environment. Uh, so put it this way, it depends on the function. So if we expect them to grow to lay down fat as, as in a finishing animal or to raise a little baby, the needs will go up and we need to respond accordingly. As drier conditions have dried up forage supplies for many producers, Alfredo recommends looking toward the future and planning early to ensure your cattle are getting the nutritional intake that they'll need to be in optimal condition for the upcoming summer months. This is the time to be worried or looking at summer, uh, late winter, evaluation of feeds and condition score, of course. 
We want these cows going back a little bit to condition score, but also to preparations for summer. We want those cows to not have lost so much condition. If we plan to keep them, this is the time to probably step up the energy in the diets, perhaps give them more corn if necessary, distillers going to higher energy feed to recover their reserves so they're ready to come back and breed successfully in say June of this year. Because of drought, pastures are probably going to be affected. So we, we will have to be very careful in overloading pastures with the same stocking rates as we had prior to the drought. With strong beef prices projected as the summer growing season comes along, it'll be in your best interest to ensure the nutrition plan you intend to implement gives your cattle the best opportunity to improve body condition and get through what could be another hot and dry summer. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. All right, thanks for that information, Bill. If you're interested in learning more from Alfredo, we've shared a couple of links with some of his publications on the Market Journal website. Happening this week in the grain markets, the U.S. Department of Agriculture on Wednesday released its March Crop Production and World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, or WASD, reports. We were joined by Jeff Peterson of Heartland Farm Partners shortly after those reports were released to get some of his thoughts and his perspectives. I have papers spread on the desk, which means it was report day today. You've been studying the numbers, breaking them down. We'll get to the specifics in a moment, but tell me about the two reports today. What are the most important, what's the most important information you're following? Yeah, I, I think as we dig into it, the two big areas that we were looking at, we, we wanted to see what happened to de demand on the corn and soybean side. We also wanted to see what happened basically in South American production. In particular, we figured it'd probably just be adjustments in the Argentine production. So what were some of the numbers that came out? Yeah, as we dig into those, I guess, we'll start first on the U.S. corn. You know, we ended up seeing them reduce the, the amount of exports, and, and that went right to the bottom line. So they increased export or decreased exports 75 million bushels. That uh, increased our ending stocks 75 million. And that's really kind of been a pattern that's been going on. You know, we've seen some uh, months before, we've seen some reduction on the export side. It's just that South America had too big of a crop. Now, on the positive side of that, though, we are getting into a point in here where I do think our, our values are, are cheaper than what they are out of Brazil, and we're at a point where we'll actually start seeing some of our exports increase. But there is a chance, as far down as, as the slowest start as we've had, Bryce, there is a chance we might need to adjust it just a little bit lower down the road. Then as we move over to soybeans, kind of just the opposite there. We ended up seeing them reduce the crush 10 million bushels. And honestly, that's, it's really strange for me. With everything that's going on with renewable diesel, I really thought in the strong demand we've had out there for, for the soybean oil and also for the soybean meal, I thought these crush plants would be running harder. But, uh, but needless to say, they did uh, reduce crush and that's supported because our crush numbers, as we look at them on a month to month basis, they're not hitting the targets where they need to. And, but the positive side is we came over on the export side and we did see a 25 million bushel increase on the export sites on soybeans. So as a result of that, that's where we ended up seeing that 15 million bushel reduction on the ending stock number for soybeans. And then you move over to Argentina and, and ultimately we ended up having an 8 million metric ton adjustment ended up happening there on, on soybeans. And to just to round that off what that is, that's about 320 million bushels. And over on the corn side to have a 7 million metric ton reduction on their corn, and that's about 280 million bushels. Um, Argentina just hasn't been able to catch a break. You know, if you roll back time, they were having hot, dry conditions and then it looked like weather improved on them. And then all of a sudden it flipped back the other way and then we end up having, of anything, we had a frost. So earlier in that week, you ended up having basically 100 degree temperatures and you come in and you have a frost and then we turn back hot and dry again. And so we haven't had a chance to hear much on yields yet. I know there is a little bit of corn harvest going on in Argentina and actually the numbers that are coming in are a little bit less than what they were expecting. We're not quite there on the bean side yet though. As we look at these numbers, of course, the traders give their guesses beforehand and they try to factor all this in. As this broadcast comes out Friday and Saturday of this week, the, the trade will be long past here. Where do you think we're going, though, with these numbers, Jeff? What do these numbers tell you about where we're at, where we're at today? Yeah, so let's just kind of step back. And I was a little bit surprised. I, I guess I thought from the report side we'd have found uh, early on, we found a little support in the corn, but, but then corn kind of sold off. I sure think we're finding a, a short-term a bottom in this corn market. I don't think we've found a long-term bottom. 
And, and from here, I think we can have a chance to bounce this bean market a little bit higher. Now, there's a lot of other factors out there that can adjust it, but that's kind of what it feels like right now, Bryce. You talked about some of these South American numbers. Share with me more about what you're seeing down there in terms of their production, where they're at, pretty dry in some places, I understand. Yeah, it, it is real dry, and, and let's just kind of walk through kind of where they're at. So let's, this time, let's start in Brazil first. So if you think about Brazil, that, that harvest got off to a really slow start. And because of basically some of the rainy conditions that they had, but the other side of that was because they really actually had some really good weather conditions, and this this crop didn't prematurely end up maturing. It it got a chance to mature on its own naturally, and as a result of that, Brazil is going to have some really good crops, and that's why in this report and in past reports we have not seen them adjust the the soybean number at all. Now I think there could be some adjustments on that soybean number. If you look at it right now, they're probably you know approaching 60. 70% harvested on the soybean side. There's parts of actually Mato Grosso, which would be their main producing state within Brazil. That's actually pretty well wrapping up. And But I think the key to how the final yield comes in is really going to depend on Rio Grande de Sul. And that's in a very southern part of Brazil. It actually kind of feels like down there, they've had some of those same conditions that they've had in Brazil or actually in Argentina, where they've actually just been a little bit too dry. So it feels like maybe that bean yield will come down a little bit. As we dig into a little bit deeper into their, their corn, that first corn crop, now keep in mind this first corn crop that they have in Brazil, that only represents about 27% or 23% basically of, of their overall production. And that's in the southern part of, of Brazil. And, and actually those yields are probably gonna be pulled off maybe just a little bit yet. But the big thing that we got to really talk about is that safrina corn crop. That safrina corn crop is getting planted. Uh, they're probably about 70% planted right now in that safrina corn crop, but they've, they've still got a ways to go yet. And the big thing that we're watching there is that it's actually kind of outside their window of optimum time in which they are getting that pl crop planted. Now, why is that a big deal? Doesn't South America get rain all the time? Well, surprisingly, Bryce, what happens down there Think about it, in January, they're getting about 10 to 12 inches of moisture per month. But by the time we get out there to July, honestly, they're only getting about a half, maybe a quarter of an inch. So the key there is that they have to get that crop in soon enough so that all of a sudden when we hit pollination and, and kernel fill, we physically aren't in that real dry time frame. And I think there's some risk of that. And so I think down the road, we might actually see that overall corn yield come down a little bit. You've set up the factors uh, influencing the market trade pretty well here, Jeff. I want to make sure we include uh, several of our viewer questions we've received this week. Kick it off here with Mike. He wanted to know your thoughts now that we've lost some of the premium in both the corn and wheat markets over the last few weeks. He asked, will there be changes in planted acres here in the U.S. with beans holding on to their strength a little bit better? Your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So let's just kind of break it apart. So there, the, the big key is going to be is that what's going to happen, you know, as we move on up into the Dakotas, we'll start up there first. What happens on spring wheat acres up there? You know, and, and could there, if we're a little bit too wet up there, could we end up pulling back some of those spring wheat acres because of prevent plan up there? I think there's a little bit of a chance of that. But a lot of the tension has to come back to the hard red winter wheat areas. And many of the hard red winter wheat areas, as you move yourself into western parts of Kansas, I think we'll see some abandonment there. But when I think we see that abandonment there, I think some of those acres end up spilling over to actually into grain sorghum if they, if they think they have a chance of, of converting that to another crop if there's enough moisture. Our overall feel, though, is that as we think about the acres, though, is that we think corn acres, if the weather is right, we think we can see a little bit of an increase yet in corn acres yet. Overall, though, we think soybeans will pretty much stay about as everybody's thinking, you know, probably come in somewhere around the 87 and a half to 88 million acre range. Let me see if I can summarize what you said so far. You talk about corn, think we might have found a level here we can stay at for a little bit. Beans might go a little bit higher. How about wheat? Clint wrote in and asked about the wheat market if you think there might be some better prices on the horizon. Well, we, we're really surprised on how much weakness we've seen in this wheat market. We're down into an area on the Kansas City wheat that we believe is finding some support, and we think there is a bounce up higher in here. Part of that reason also has to go over to Ukraine and the discussion about what is their wheat crop going to turn out, you know, we know that their initial acres are probably down about 36%. So overall, I would say that there should be some smaller areas out of there. But the thing we have to remember about wheat, though, Bryce, is that it's grown everywhere and it's used everywhere. Yep. We wrap up with this question. Long lines of the eleva elevator right now, people moving some old crop. 
Are you continuing to move old crop right now or hanging on for some better prices? So we've got a lot of old crop moved. What we're looking to do in here though is that on any little bounce here, we're gonna advance old crop. We're also gonna be physically working on getting more new crops sold. Reward the market. Jeff, appreciate your time. You bet, thanks a lot. Great information there from Jeff. We also appreciate the producer questions which were submitted. Now coming up next week, we will be joined by Heather Ramsey. She'll join us from the ARC Group. Well, did you realize that there are around 90 farmers markets in Nebraska? That number surprised me a bit, but for those who frequent those farmers markets, they tell you that they appreciate the direct to consumer approach as well as the fresh ag products available. Homegrown vegetable crops, meat and other ag products are gaining popularity as well as a premium price at those farmers markets. But there's also some risks and costs involved for producers. You can learn more about how to become a farmers market vendor if you're interested in that in the March issue of the Nebraska Farmer. Finally, today, planting season is quickly approaching. If you haven't done so already, you might soon be bringing that planter into the shop for some maintenance. Dave Panko owns and operates Panko Ag Solutions out of Dakin, Nebraska. For this week's Crop Talk segment, he shared some valuable insights with us on getting your planter ready for that spring planting season. Here's Bill Dodd. In short, a well-maintained planter will give seeds their best chance to flourish throughout the growing season. A majority of the physical responsibilities for pushing soil, placing seed, and getting things off on the right foot rests squarely on the shoulders of the planter. Making sure this piece of equipment is in top working order will give you the best possible start for achieving maximum yield performance. Really for, for any row crop farmer, in my opinion, the planter is their most valuable piece of equipment. The biggest impact on any crop is largely determined by the planter and the performance of that planter. We need to have seeds placed accurately and provide an even emergence of that crop um, to, to gain the, the highest yield. Uh, out in, in front of the row unit itself, you're gonna have your row cleaner that's going to clear out any residue or root ball that you have in the way or dirt um, to provide a clean surface for, for the planter running it behind it. So then behind that you have a true V disc that's going to form a furrow for that seed to drop in. And the depth of that true V disc is going to be determined by a gauge wheel that, that, that is right next to those discs. And up above at the same time when this furrow is forming, you're going to have a meter that is singulating and dropping the seed as accurate as possible. And that seed is falling down through a seed tube and placed in the bottom of, of the, the seed trench. And behind that, and you can be, as some guys, if they choose to do so, um, would, would drop fertilizer in the seed trench. And then behind that, you would have some sort of, of closing wheel or closing system that's going to close that, that seed trench up. With so much happening in one fell swoop, it's easy to understand why proper maintenance is so crucial to your operation. One of the first thing your planter does is clear debris and move soil with the row cleaners. This will be a good place to start as you may run into problems including yield loss without proper maintenance of this component. Most likely you're going to either clean too much or not enough residue or dirt ahead of your row unit, which is going to cause uneven emergence or possibly leave seeds on top of the ground. And you would cause um, basically a loss in yield potential. For most row cleaners, you're going to have a linkage or an, an arm for a floating row cleaner that is, and you need to check that linkage as well as the bearings that on the wheels themselves um, those need to be um, serviced um, every year. And if you do have a fixed row cleaner, you also want to check those bearings on, on those wheels as well and make sure that, that they are, are properly maintenanced. Next on the agenda will be to check your V disc or opener. This component is responsible for opening a consistent furrow and placing seed at a consistent depth. The, the first place we start is a diameter of the disc. The OEM manufacturers are going to have specs of when those need to be replaced. For a John Deere planter, brand new, those discs are 15 inches. And at a 
14 and a half inches or less, those discs need to be replaced. For a Case IH planter, brand new, those are 14 inches, and at 13 and a half inches, those discs need to be replaced. But any of those um, specs you can find from, from an OAM dealer, uh, especially properly shimming those discs. Um, so that's the, the gauge wheels are lined up to the, the, the true V disc and those need to be properly shimmed so that they, they press against the true V and provide a good depth gauge with that. There are many options available to producers when it comes to applying down force or down pressure during the planting process. Too much or too little, and you could wind up costing yourself over the long haul. However, there are some extra measures you can take to ensure that doesn't become an issue. To set down force correctly, we need to have clarity on what the row unit is doing itself. I mean, there's sensors we can mount on the row unit that will tell you if there is a smooth ride and if that row unit is staying on the ground at all times. Those, those sensors can be placed and you can have those readings um, in the monitor. Secondly, we can put a, a weight pin on the row that will tell us the amount of weight we're pushing down on the row. Typically, when a, a grower is planting, if he is applying more than 450 pounds of pressure on that row, you're going to be causing compaction. So between the, the sensor and the weigh pin, we can determine if we're providing enough pressure or too little pressure when we're planting. Farm machinery is an investment. As such, you'll want to achieve the best return possible on that investment. Failing to get a proper start in the best possible seed bed, crops will ultimately be challenged from the onset to grow to their full potential. With proper maintenance and some fine tuning, your planter should get your growing season started on the right foot. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Dave also tells us that planter maintenance is paramount for producers in no-till or reduced-till systems. If that is you, a majority of soil manipulation and seed placement rests on the shoulders of your planter. Well, that is going to do it for this week's broadcast. Do remember that if you missed a story, we post all our content on our YouTube channel. You can also follow Market Journal online via our social media channels to join in on the conversation. We hope to see you back here next time. Until then, I'm Bryce Duskett, wishing you a safe and productive week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Partial funding is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.